whether it's a product for home or business, farm or factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. and given to Titus and to Martius battle. I saw our party driven to their trenches and then I came away. What has become of Martius? Slain, sir, doubtless. He moved alone and none would follow. He was a soldier even to Cato's wish. Not fierce and terrible only in strokes, but with his grim looks and the thunder like percussion of his sounds, he made his enemies shake as if the world were feverous and it trembled. Come, make us quick in work to help our friends each to his duties as I have set them down. By the gods they fly! And the gates of Corioli are open to us. The general! Come I too late? Oh, general, here is the steed. We the caparison, hast thou beheld, Marshal? I have, and I report it where senators shall mingle tears with smiles, where great patricians shall attend and say, we thank the gods our Rome hath such a soldier. Pray you, sir, no more. I have done as you have done, that's what I can. Induced as you have been, that's for my country. You shall not be the grave of your deserving. Rome must know the value of her own. I have some wounds upon me, and they smart to hear themselves remembered. Should they not well, might they fest against ingratitude and tempt themselves with death. Of all the treasure in this field achieved and city, we render you the tenth to be tamed forth at your only choice. I thank you, General but cannot make my heart consent to take a bribe to pay my steel. Martius! 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 Too modest are you. More cruel to your good report than grateful to us that give you truly. Therefore be it known, as to us, to all the world, that Caius Martius wears this war's tribute. And from this time, for what he did before Corioli, call we him with all the applause and clamor of the host, Caius Martius, Coriolanus! 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 I will go wash. When my face is fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. How be it, I thank you. The blood upon thy visage dries. Come, tis time it should be looked to. Pray you, daughters, sing, or express yourself in a more comfortable sort. 
My son were my husband, I should freely rejoice in that absence wherein he won honor, than in the embracements of his bed where he would show most love. When yet he was but tender-bodied and the only son of my womb, I, considering how honor would become such a person, was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. But had he died in the business, madam, how then? Then his good report should have been my son. Hear me profess sincerely. Had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, I had rather had eleven die nobly for their country than one voluptuously surfeit out of action. Madam, the Lady Valeria is come to visit with you. I beseech you, madam, give me leave to retire myself. Indeed you shall not. Tell Valeria we are fit to bid her welcome. Methinks I hear hither your husband's drum. Methinks I see him stamp thus and call thus. Come on, you coward, you are got in fear, though you were born in Rome. His bloody brow with his mailed hand then wiping, forth he goes like the harvestman that's tasked to mow or all or lose his hire. His bloody brow. Oh, Jupiter, no blood. Oh, away, you fool, it does become a man. Her ladyship. My ladies both. Good day to you. Sweet madam. I'm glad to see your ladyship. And have you not heard what everyone is crying in the streets? Your husband has come back to Rome. Even now, as I neared the gate, I heard the echo of the drums far off. Come, there's no time to waste. I know no more. Caius Marshall! Wonderful! What means that call, Menenius? Our armies are returned, and as I hear, in triumph. Does this mean yet another victory for Caius Marshall? Aye, which is not to the wishes of the people, for they love not Marshall. Especially his pride. You blame Marshall for being proud? We do it not alone, sir. You can do very little alone. Your abilities are too infant-like for doing much alone. Come, come, Menenius. We know you well enough. You know neither me, yourselves, nor anyone. When you speak best under the purpose, it is not worth the wagging of your heads, the contents of which deserve not so honorable a grave as to stuff an ass's pack saddle. Mm. Yet you must be saying Martius is proud. Good day to your worship. How oh, now, my fair as noble lady. Honorable Menenius, my boy Martius approaches. The word precedes you, Martius has come home. Yes, worthy Menenius, and with most prosperous approbation. In truth, there's no one percent Aye, I warrant you, are not without his true purpose. The gods grant you, of course they're true. The trumpet. did fight within Corioli Gate, where he has won with fame a name, Coriolanus! <laughs> no more of this, it does offend my heart. I pray you no more. Look, sir, you mock. You have, I know, petitioned all the gods for my prosperity. My gentle Martius, worthy Caius, and with deed achieving honor newly named. What is it? Coriolanus must I call thee? But oh, thy wife. My gracious silence hail. <laughs> what would you have would you have laughed that I come coffined home that weep to see me triumph? Now the gods crown you. You are three that Rome should dote on. Yet by the faith of men, we have some old crab trees here at home who would not be grafted to your relish. Yet welcome, warrior. Hey! Your hand and yours. Here in our own house I do shade my head. The good patricians must be visited, from whom I have received not only greetings, but with them change of honors. Oh, I have lived to see inherited my very wishes and the buildings of my fancy. Only there's one thing wanting, which I doubt not but our Rome will cast upon you. No, good mother, I had rather be their servant in my way than sway with them in theirs. On to the capital! <laughs>
such a potter. On a sudden, I warrant him counsel. Were he to stand for counsel, never would he appear in the marketplace, nor on him put the napless vesture of humility. It shall be to him, then, as our good wills assure destruction. So it must fall out. We must suggest the people in what hatred he still hath held them, that to his power he would have made them mules, holding them in human action and capacity of no more soul nor fitness for the world than camels. You are sent forth to the capital. Tis thought that marshals may be consul. Let's to the capital and carry with us ears and eyes for the time, but hearts for the event. I have with you. Almost here. How many stand for consulship? Three, they say. His thought of everyone, Coriolanus, will carry it. He's a brave fellow, but he's vengeance proud and loves not the common people. <laughs> there have been many great men that have flattered the people who ne'er loved them. But he seeks their hate with greater devotion than they can render it him. He hath deserved worthily of his country. For their tongues to be silent and not confess so much were a kind of ingrateful injury. No more of him, he's a worthy fellow. Oh, make way, here they come. Please you, most reverend and grave elders, to desire the present consul and last general in our well-found successors to report a little of that worthy work performed by Caius Martius Coriolanus. Speak, good Comenius. Proceed, Comenius. Master of the people, we do request your kindest ears. I shall lack words. The deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. It is held that valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the habit. If it be, the man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. At 16 years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. In that day's feats, he proved best man in the field, and for his meed was brow-bound with the oak. His pupil age, man entered thus, he waxed like a seed. For this last at Corioli, let me say I cannot speak him whole. From face to foot, he was a thing of blood, whose every motion was timed with dying cries, until we call both field and city ours, he never stood to ease his breast with panting. Worthy man, he cannot but with measure fit the honors which we devise him. Our spoils he kicked at and looked upon things precious as they were the common muck of the world. He covets less than misery itself would give and rewards his deeds with doing them. He is right noble. Let him be called for. Uh, call Coriolanus. Caius Marcius Coriolanus. <laughs> The Senate, Coriolanus, are well pleased to make you consul. I do owe them still my life and services. It then remains that you do speak to the people. Oh, I beseech you, let me all eat that custom. For I cannot put on the gown, stand naked, and entreat them for my wound's sake to give their suffrage. Sir, the people must have their voices. Uh, go fetch you to the custom. It is a part that I shall blush in acting to brag unto them thus I did and thus. Show them the unaching scars, which I should hide as if I had received them for the hire of the breath of me. Do not stand upon it. <clears throat> we recommend to you, tribunes of the people, our purpose to them. And to our noble consul wish we all joy and honor. To Coriolanus come all joy and honor. You see how he intends to use the people. May they perceive his intent. Come, we'll inform them of our proceedings here. Then if he do require our voices, we ought not to deny him. We may, sir, if we will. Ingratitude is monstrous. And if the multitude be ungrateful, we're to make a monster of the multitude. He himself stuck not to call us the many-headed multitude. We've been called so by many. Are you all resolved to give your voices? Well, I say that if he will incline to the people, there's never been a word of demand. Here he comes. I pray, 
sir, plague upon you. I cannot bring my tongue to such a case. Look, sir, my wounds. I got them in my country's service when some certain of your brethren roared and ran from the noise of our own drums. They do not speak of that, you mar all. Did them wash their faces and keep their teeth clean? You know the cause of my standing here. Well, tell us what has brought you to it. My own deserts. Your own deserts? <laughs> It was never my desire yet to trouble with begging. I would but know your price for the consulship. The price, sir, is to ask it kindly. You have deserved nobly of your country, but have not indeed loved the common people. You should account for the more virtuous that I have not been common in my love. <laughs> better it is to die, better to starve, than crave the hire which first we do deserve. Why should I stand here? Custom calls me to it. I asked your voices! Your voices. For your voices have I fought, watched for your voices. For your voices have done many things, some less, some more. Indeed, I would be constant. Oh, yeah. oh, he has done nobly and should not go without the voice of every honest man. Oh, oh, let him be counsel. The gods give him joy and make him good friend to the people. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Well, you have stood your limitation. It only remains within the official marks and vest that you'll now do me to send it. And by his looks, methinks tis warm at his heart. Aye. How now, masters, have you uh, chose this man? He has our voices, sir. We pray the gods he may deserve your love. My poor unworthy notice, he mocked us when he begged our voices. Certainly, he flouted us downright. No, tis but his form of speech, he mocked us not. Not one amongst us save yourself, but says he treated us scornfully. I uh, would be consul, says he. Was not this mockery? No. And do you think that this contempt shall not be bruising to you now that he has power to crush? He's not confirmed. We may deny him yet. And we'll deny him. I'll have 500 voices of that sound. Get you hence instantly. And tell those friends that they have chosen a consul that will take from them their liberties. Say you chose him more after our commandment than is guided by your own true affection. Lay the fault on us. Aye, spare us not. Lay on that still. But make believe as though we did the whole thing all ourselves. Get along, get along. Get along. Off the street. Off the street. Let them go. This mutiny were better put in hazard than stay past out for greater. We have the vantage of his anger now. Let us reap the harvest. you've seen part one of Cariolanus, let's turn to our Westinghouse program and Betty Furness. This space reserved. Say, what's it reserved for? Well, now that summer is here, fresh fruits and vegetables are cheap. So most people who own one of these wonderful new Westinghouse frost-free refrigerators reserve a big space in here for doing their own home freezing. Look, you can keep your own home frozen foods in all this space. This big freeze chest is a real home freezer with loads of room for frozen food and ice. For instance, fresh strawberries are delicious right now, and in many places you can get them for 12 cents a pint. Last winter they were 75 cents a pint, so why not freeze and store them now for the time when they'll be out of season? 
you'll find it so easy to freeze them and wonder of wonders, they'll stay solidly, firmly frozen all the time, even during defrosting. And the reason for that is this button here. This is the secret of the Westinghouse frost-free system. You see, the warm air that enters the refrigerator when you open the door causes frost. And the moment that frost starts to form here in the freeze chest, this button gives a signal. And the frost-free system wipes away every little trace of frost so swiftly that your frozen foods stay safely, steadily frozen. And remember, there are no pans or jars to empty because the defrost water is evaporated, poof, just like that. And in addition to this big, wonderful home freeze chest, this Westinghouse frost-free refrigerator also gives you a butter keeper, a meat keeper, loads of room in these colorful new shelves for storing food under normal cold conditions, two humid drawers, and egg keepers. Think of getting a real home freezer and a big refrigerator all in one cabinet and with the famous frost-free system that never needs defrosting. No other refrigerator can touch this one. So go to your Westinghouse dealer for your demonstration tomorrow. Remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. And now let's return to Westinghouse Studio One and Cariolanus. dangerous to go on. What means this change? The people are incensed against him. Are these your herd? Have you not set them on? Be calm, be calm. This is a purpose thing and grows by plot. Called not a plot, the people cry. You mock them. Have you informed them so? Oh, I inform them. You're like to do such business. Uh, let's be calm. The people are abused, set on. This paltry becomes not Rome, nor has Coriolanus deserved this so dishonored rub. Laid falsely of the plain way of his merit. This was my speech and I will speak again. Not, not in no, this heat, sir, now. Now, as I live, I will. My nobler friends, I crave their pardons. But for the mutable, rank-scented many, I say again, in soothing them, we nourish against our Senate the cockle of rebellion. No, no more, more words, we beseech you. How no more? You speak of the people as if you were a god to punish, not a man of their infirmity. So well, we let the people know it. Why shall the people give one who speaks thus their voice? I'll give my reasons, more worthier than their voices. Let deeds express what's like to be their words. We did request it. We are the greater pole. And in true fear they gave us our demands. Thus we debase the nature of our seats and make the rabble call our cares our fears. Now come, enough. Enough of overmeasure. No. Where wisdom cannot conclude but by the yea and no of general ignorance, it must omit real necessity and give way the while to unstable slightness. Nothing is done to purpose. Your dishonor mangles true judgment and bereaves the state of that integrity that should become not having the power to do the good it would for the ill which doth control it. Is spoken like a traitor. And shall answer as traitors do. Oh, 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 this a council, no. No, no. Hence, what you bring, or I'll shake your bones out of your garments. Of both sides, more respect. Here's he that will take from you your power. Seize him. Yeah. 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 To unbuild the city and to lay all that. What is the city but the people? Aye, 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 aye. I consent of all we were established the people's magistrates. Aye, and to remain so. This aye. deserves death.
from among you have beheld me fighting, come try upon yourselves what you have seen. Go down! Get you gone! Stand fast, we have as many friends as enemies. Come try along with us! I would they were barbarians, as they are, though in Rome littered. Not Romans, as they are not, though carved to the porch of the Capitol. I pray you be gone. Come away! People, dear people, this man has marred his fortune. His nature's too noble for the world. He would not let a Neptune for his trial. Uh, he should be thrown down the top in rock. Uh, hey! Rigorous hands, yes, resisted law. Uh, Therefore, law shall scorn him for the trial and the severity of the public power, which he so sets at naught. Do not cry, have it, where you should be hunt with modest warrant. We'll hear no more. Pursue him to his house and put away. Uh, one word more, one word. Proceed by process, lest parties, as he is beloved, break out and sack great Rome with Rome. Oh, Give me leave, I'll go to him and undertake to bring him where he shall answer by a lawful form in peace to his utmost it peril. It is the humane way, the other course will prove too oh, oh, Stay, stay! Be you then as the people's officer. Meet on the marketplace, we'll attend you there. Where, if you bring not Marcius, we'll proceed in our first way. I'll bring him to you. Let them pull all about my ears. Present me death on the wheel or at wild horse's heels, yet will I still be thus to them. I muse that you, mother, do not approve me further. Would you have me false to my nature? I would have had you put your power well on before you'd worn it out. Let them hang. Die and burn, too. Madam. Ah. Madam. Melenius. Madam Coriolanus, come, come. You have been too rough. Something too rough. You must return and mend it. There is no remedy unless by not so doing our good city cleave in the midst and perish. Pray be counseled. I have a heart as little apt as yours but yet a brain that leads my use of anger to better vantage. What must I do? Return to the tribunes. And then, what then? Repent of what you spoke. To them? I cannot do it to the gods. Must I do it to them? Look, you are too absolute. It is the honor in your wars to seem the same you are not, which for your best ends you adopt your policy. How is it less or worse that it shall hold companionship in peace? Why force you this? Because that now it lies you want to speak to the people. Come, go with us. Now, I pray you now, my son, go to them. Say to them you are their soldier, and being bred in broils, have not that soft way which you do confess were fit for you to use, as they to claim in asking their good loves. But you will frame yourself for sooth hereafter theirs, so far as you have power and person. This but done, even as she speaks, why their hearts were yours. Madam, madam. So I have been in the marketplace, and certes fit you make strong party or defend yourself by calmness or by absence, all's in anger. Must I, with my base tongue, give to my noble heart a lie that it must bear? Come, come, we'll prompt you. My praises made you first a soldier, so now to have my praise for this. Perform a part you have not done before. Well, I must do it. Away my disposition. Possess me some harlot spirit. Smiles of knaves tent in my cheeks. And schoolboy's tears take up the glasses of my sight. I mock at death with as big a heart as you. But do as you will. Your valiantness was mine, you sucked it from me. But oh, your pride yourself. Be content, mother. I am going to the marketplace. Chide me no more. I'll mountebank their loves, cog their hearts from them, and come back beloved of all the trades in Rome. Now, pray let us go. Let them accuse me by invention. I will answer in mine honor. Aye, but mildly. Oh, mildly, then, mildly. this word among the people, and when they hear me say it shall be so in the right and strength of the commons, be it either in death, fine, or banishment, 
Let them, if I say fine, cry fine. If I say death, cry death. Insisting on the old prerogatives and power in the strength of the cause. I will inform them. Go about it. Put him to collar straight. He hath been used ever to conquer. Once chafed, he cannot again be reigned to temperance. And here he comes. Must all determine here? I do demand that you submit you to the people's voices. Allow their officers and are content to suffer lawful censure for such faults as may be proved upon you. I am content. No, citizens, he says he is content. <laughs> but first would I know what's the matter? That being passed for consul with full voice. I am so dishonored that the very hour you take it off again. Answer to us, answer to us! Say then, it is true I want so. We charge you that you have contrived to wind yourself into a power tyrannical for which you are a traitor to the people. Oh, traitor! Uh, I am the lowest hill hold in the people. Call me their traitor? I would say you lie with a voice as free as I do pray the gods. Ah! Fuck you, this people! Mother. Yeah. No, I can I will go no further! Let them pronounce the steep Tarpeian death on me. I would not buy their mercy at the price of one fair word. In the name of the people, we banish in the city! Hey. In the people's name, I say, it shall be so! Hey. Consul, and can show for Rome my enemies marks upon me. I do love my country's good with a respect more tender, more holy and profound than my own life. Then if I should speak that... Speak what? We know your drift. There's no more to be said, but he is banished as enemy to the people and his country. It what? shall be so. <laughs> Common cry of curs, whose breath I hate as reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air. I banish you, and here remain in your uncertainty. Let every feeble rumor shake your hearts. Your enemies, with nodding of their plumes, fan you into despair have still the power to banish your defenders. Until at length, your ignorance, which finds not till it feels, deliver you as most abated captives to some nation that won you without blows. Despising for you the city, thus I turn my back. There is a world Come, no more tears, a brief farewell. The beast with many heads butts me away. Nay, mother, where is your ancient courage? We were used to say extremity was the trier of spirits that common chances common men could bear. Oh, God! May no, I pray you, no. woman? Now the red pestilence strike all trades in Rome and occupations perish. What, what, what? I shall be loved when I am lacked. I'll do well yet. A 
old and true Menenius. Your tears are salter than a younger man's, and venomous to your eyes. Good Titus. The Duke Ominius, my sometime general. Tell these sad women tis fun to wail inevitable strokes as tis to laugh at them. Oh, my first son, where will you go? See me but out at gate. When I am forth, bid me farewell and smile. Now turn and leave me. Requite your love. Please, Nay, please. and you shall hear more. You shall stay too. I would I had the power to say so to my husband. I would he had continued to his country as he began. I would he had. I would he had. Twas you incensed the rabble. Hey, okay, let's go. Yes, ere you go, hear this. So far as does the capital exceed the meanest house in Rome, so far my son, this lady's husband here, this do you see, whom you have banished, does exceed you all. Why stay we to be baited with one who wants her wit? So take my prayers with you. I would the gods had nothing else to do but to confirm my curses. Could I meet her but once a day, it would unclog my heart of what lies heavy to it. You have told them home and by my truth you had cause. You will sup with me? Anger's my meat. I'll sup upon myself, and so shall starve with feeding. Let's pause for a moment and turn to our program again and Betty Finesse. Are you clothes conscious? Well, it looks as if she is. Well, of course I am. Aren't you? And if you want to keep those pretty cottons clean and nice as new all summer long, here's your answer. The wonderful Westinghouse laundromat. Even your filmiest nightgowns, like this one I have here, like that, and your most delicate curtains are perfectly safe in the laundromat. And the reason is, the laundromat's patented inclined washing action is so gentle. What's more, it's so thorough that even soiled gardening clothes like this get absolutely clean. Now, I'm sure that most of you have heard about this famous Westinghouse exclusive, the Way to Save Door. It's actually a scale, and here's where you read it. You see? It says that this is a small load. So you set the water saver dial over here at small, and the laundromat automatically measures the small amount of water needed for this load. No wasting costly hot water. Then you just slip the clothes in, add the small amount of soap required for this load, close it, start it, and that's all. The way to save door and the water saver really save you money because they save so much soap and hot water. Now, here's something very important for any woman to think about before she buys a washer. The wrong washing action in a washer can actually harm your clothes. But how can you tell which washer has the right washing action? Why not ask the people who really know? And here's their answer. The coveted Merit Award presented to the Westinghouse Laundromat by the American Society of Industrial Engineers. The laundromat is the only washer with the right to wear this seal because this famous engineer's society decided that it gives the very finest performance of any washer made. So go to your Westinghouse dealer and see the only washer with the merit award, the laundromat. Remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. We return now to Westinghouse Studio One and Coriolanus.
Arioni, city whose name I bear, for the wreck that I have made of its good name, the people its streets with widows. Here a suppliant I stand. O oh, world, thy slippery turns. I pray you, sir. Is yes. this Ophidia's house? That is it, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Ellis foes, by some trick not worth an egg, shall grow dear friends and interjoin their issues. <coughs> what would you have, friend? I would speak with your master. Away, I know you not. What fellow is this? Stranger one as ever I've looked on. What have you to do here, fellow? Let me but stand, I'll not hurt your heart. Inform our master. What are you? A gentleman. Hmm. Marvelous poor one. True, so I am. Well, pray, poor fellow, take up some other station. Here is no place for you. Pray you avoid. Come. Where is this fellow? Here, sir. Speak, man. What's your name? A name unmusical to your ears, Ophidius. Your face bears a command in it, though your tackle's torn. My name is Coriolanus. Only the name remains. The cruelty and envy of the people, permitted by our dastard nobles, who have all forsook me, have devoured the rest, and suffered me, by the voice of slaves, to be whooped out of Rome. Now this extremity brings me to your heart. Not out of hope, mistake me not, to save my life, but in mere spite to be full quit of those my banishers, stand I before you here. And if you have a heart of reek in you that will revenge your own particular wrongs, let my misery serve your turn. So use it that my revengeful services will prove as benefits to you. For I will fight against my cankered country with the spleen of all the under fiends. Marcius, Marcius, each word you've spoke has weeded from my heart a root of ancient envy. Worthy Marcius, had we no quarrel else to Rome save your banishment, we would muster all from twelve to seventy, and pouring war into the bowels of ungrateful Rome like a bold flood or bear. A thousand welcomes and more a friend than e'er an enemy. Then we shall have a rising world again. Let me have war, say I. It exceeds peace as far as day does night. This peace is nothing but a lethargy to rust iron and make men hate one another. So let Rome hear. For we are rising, rising! I welcome here for him who once was enemy, now friend, Coriolanus. <laughs> that guy will not believe it. Never. Never. Hear this, hear this. The Senate now is met. A fearful army led by Caius Martius, associated with Orphidius, rages upon our territories and have since all borne their way. Consumed with fire and took what lay before them. Now comes our general, Cominius. He will be heard. He will be heard. Ah, you have made good work. What news? What news? What of Coriolanus? He is their god. He leads him as a thing made by some other deity than nature. Made good work, you and your apron men. You that stood so much upon the voice of occupation and the breath of Garlicitos. He'll shake your Rome about your ears. We're all undone unless the noble man have mercy. Say not we brought it. Who then? How was we? We loved him, but like beasts. While cowardly nobles gave way unto your clusters who did hoot him out of the city. But I fear they'll roar him in again. Tell us, Ophidius, the second name a man obeys his points as if he were his officer. Desperation is all the force and strength that Rome can make against them. Saw you him, Comenius. Was he deaf to reason? Minded you him how royal it was to pardon when it was less expected? He would not seem to know me. Do you hear? Yet one time he did call me by my name. I urged our old acquaintance and the drops that we had bled together. Coriolanus he would not answer to. Forbade all names. He was a kind of nothing. Titleless. Till he had forged himself a name of the fire of burning Rome. There but remains one course. It is for you, Menenius, to speak for us and for the people. He called you father once. It is unlike he will now fail to hear your voice. If he coyed to hear good Cominius speak, I'll not meddle. Pray you, go to him. 
What should I do? Only make trial of what your love can do for Rome towards Martius. So, I'll undertake it. I think he'll listen to me, but to bite his lip and hum at good Cominius much unhearts me. He'll never hear him. No? I tell you, he'd a sit in gold, his eye red as twould burn Rome, and his injury the jailer to his pity. All hope is vain, unless his noble mother and his wife do solicit him for mercy to his country. She and only she can join him. No more away. How oh, away? Wife, mother, child, I know not. My affairs are servanted to others, therefore be gone. My ears against your suits are stronger than your gates against my force. This man was my beloved. If you beheld, you keep a constant temper. This last old man, with a cracked heart I have sent to Rome, loved me above the measure of a father, nay, guarded me indeed. And the latest refuge was to send him. Fresh embassies and suits, nor from the state, nor private friends, hereafter will I lend ear to. Wife, son, I'd melt. I'm not of stronger earth than others. Without affection, all bond and privilege of nature break. Let it be virtuous to be obstinate. Lord and husband. These eyes are not the same I wore in Rome. The sorrow that delivers us thus changed makes you think so. Best of my flesh, forgive my tyranny. But do not say for that, forgive our Romans. Oh, a kiss long as my exile, sweet as my revenge. Now, oh, my jealous queen of heaven, that kiss I carried from you, dear, and my true lip has virgined it ever since. Of gods I prayed. And the most noble mother of the world leave unseen. You are my warrior, I helped you bring. I will so did inform your thoughts of nobleness that you may prove to shame unvulnerable. This my brave boy. Even he, your wife, and I are suitors to you. I beseech you, peace. Or if you'd ask, remember this before. Do not bid me dismiss my soldiers or capitulate to Rome's entreaties. Oh, no more, only hear us. Ophidius, mark. We'll hear naught from Rome in private. Your request. Your sight, which should make our eyes flow with joy, hearts dance with comforts constrains them weep and shake with fear and sorrow. Making the mother, wife, and child to see the son, the husband, and the father tearing his country's bowels out. We must find an evident calamity. For either you must, as a foreign recreant, be led with manacles through our streets, or else triumphantly tread on your country's ruin and bear the palm for having bravely shed your wife and children's blood. You shall no sooner march to assault your country than to tread. Just do it, you shall not, on your mother's womb that brought you to this world. I and mine, that brought you forth this boy to keep your name living in time. I have sat too long. Hey, do not promise thus I will be heard. You know, great son, the end of war is uncertain. But this certain, that if you conquer Rome, the benefit which you shall thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. You do not speak. Why? 
To your surname, Coriolanus longs more pride and pity to our prayers. An end. This is the last. So we will home to Rome and die among our neighbors. Come, let us go. Give us our dispatched. I am hushed until our city be afire, and then I'll speak a little. Oh, mother, mother. What have you done? You have won a happy victory for Rome. But for your son, believe it, oh, believe it, most dangerously you have with him prevailed, if not most mortal to him. But let it come. If it is, though I cannot make true wars, I'll frame convenient peace. Oh, Phidias, were you in my stead? Would you have heard a mother less, or answered less, Ophidius? I was moved with all. I'll dare be sworn you were. And, sir, it is no little thing to make my eyes to sweat compassion. But, sir, what peace you'll make advise me. For my part, I'll not to roam. You shall bear a better witness back than words. All the swords in Italy and her confederate arms could not have made this peace. It is well. They have set his mercy and his honor at difference in him. And out of that, I'll work myself a firmer fortune. Stand close, he comes. Most welcome. How is it with our general? Even so, as with a man by his own arms empoisoned and with his charity slain. Most noble sir, if you do hold the same intent wherein you made us parties, we will deliver you of your great danger. I raised him, and I pawned mine honor for his truth who, being so heightened, watered his new plants with dews of flattery, seducing so my friends. Till at the last I seemed his follower, not partner. Therefore shall he die. And I'll renew me in his fall. Citizens of Corioli, hail! We have made peace with no less honor to you than shame to the citizens of Rome. And we here deliver, subscribed by the consuls and patricians, together with the seal of the Senate, what we have compounded on. Read it not, but tell the traitor in the highest degree he has abused your powers. You traitor? Yes, traitor, Marcius. Marcius? Yes, Marcius. Caius Marcius. Do you think I'll grace you with that robbery, thy stolen name, Coriolanus, in Corioli? Perfidiously, he has betrayed your business and given up a certain drops of salt, your city, Rome. I say, your city, to his wife and mother. Breaking your oath and resolution like a twist of rotten silk, thou boy of tears. Measureless liar. You have made my heart too great for what contains it. False hound, 
If you have writ your annals true, tis there that like an eagle in a dovecot, I fluttered your Volstians in Corioli. Alone I did it! Boy. My noble lords, will you be put in mind of his blind fortune, which was your shame, by this unholy braggart for your own eyes and ears? Insolent villain! <laughs> My noble masters, hear me speak. Oh, tell us you have done a deed where it fellow a wit. Treat not upon him, masters. Put up your steel. My lords, when you shall know, as in this rage provoked by him you cannot, the great danger which this man's life did owe you, you'll rejoice that he is thus cut off. Bear from hence his body and mourn you for him. My rage is gone, and I am struck with sorrow. Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded many a one, which to this hour bewail the injury, yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist. we look at next week's Westinghouse program, Betty Furness wants to introduce you to someone you may not have met before. Hello again. Tonight's program was the last Studio One program in this series for this season. Of course, Studio One is going to be back in the fall, and Westinghouse is going to bring you a big dramatic show this summer. But right now, I want to introduce to you the producer of Studio One, Mr. Television Behind the Scenes himself, Worthington Minor. Hello, Tony. Hello, Betty. I'm very glad that this is a season that is over, and I only hope that our next season will be as good as this one that has gone by. Well, I'm sure it will, Tony. I know that I'm speaking for the millions of people who watch Studio One, as well as for Westinghouse and myself, when I say that you've brought us the outstanding dramatic program on television. Well, that's our aim, and I'm very glad that we're going to have a wonderful summer theater from Westinghouse to hold this audience together and be ready for us in the fall. We're starting off next week with a program about a real screwball. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and... I'm going to be around for the summer, and let's all wish Mr. Minor a wonderful vacation, and we'll see you again next week at the Westinghouse Summer Theater. <laughs>